रोहित यही मीटिंग है ना यस सर टू सेशन वन है हाँ यही है सर यही भेजा था लिंक तो आपने गुड मॉर्निंग सर गुड मॉर्निंग सर म्यूटेड यू विवेक आई आई एम फाइन सर हाउ आर यू फाइन फाइन गुड मॉर्निंग राइट it's it's a uh, yeah as per the plan yeah so how is your is it's fine it's a bit difficult uh, nowadays but uh, now students are coming back yeah. and uh, we have opened the lab uh, our btech students are not here but mtech students and phd students are more or less here now so yeah, it's uh, getting uh, usual okay good at least okay it is coming back to normal that is important yes <laughs> yes how are things sir yeah we are as far as office is concerned that uh, it is functioning uh, we full uh, full attendance you know but uh, but the research phd student research student they all have come back quite a long time back uh, you know Okay. Only visitors. We are lit, we are restrictive about uh, calling visitors. Okay. Or we ourselves are not going uh, that much out. I mean, mm -hmm. I uh, only two weeks back. I once I traveled to IOP for five days. There also, uh -huh. if we can do from here, I am not going there. This kind. Uh -huh. Okay. 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 This mm. yes. So how was the program uh, yesterday? Good. It was very good. Yes. Uh, yeah. We had talks. Uh, I mean, really nice talks. Um, uh, Professor Didi Sharma was also there yesterday. Also, uh, mm -hmm. because he chaired the first session. Uh, yeah, I, I looked at the program. Yes. Yeah. So uh, the talks were really good. Mm -hmm. Yesterday, actually, I had to organize joint meeting between SINP, BRC, and IOP for. a collaboration so that occupied me good part of the day today between brc and tifr in the afternoon you know okay okay yeah, so. okay. yeah the, uh, my convener has joined uh swankar i'll just hi good morning, good morning. Hi, everyone. Hello, sir. Yusuf, how are you? Yes, I'm. Uh, I'm good. How are you? Good morning. Fine, Very good fine. morning. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. After a long time. Yes, after a long time. Nice to see you all. Thank at least, you. at least virtually. Thank you. <laughs> Once everything goes well, please come to our place. We yeah, all are sure. waiting for all of you. <laughs> sure, sure. And same to we you. You should also. Our, yeah, we will now move to a new campus at INST. <clears throat> okay. Okay. Good. as a new campus you have moved okay i didn't know this yes. but okay mm -hmm. yeah you are supposed to have one one meeting i uh, i remember right 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 we are planning but maybe at the end of this year something will let you know and we'll discuss in detail yeah yeah okay good yeah, sure thank you <clears throat>
So how is uh, Hiranghos doing? Good? Yes, yes, very good. He's, he has a chair today. He is okay. now very busy with his students and lab and everything. And he yeah. is a kind of very always energetic yeah. person. Yeah, yeah. Speaker is Professor Didi Sharma. Yes. Didi, then Anand Chatya, then Kalavaran uh, Maiti, and Gautam. Uh, yeah. Hi, Subankar. So. Good morning. So what is the total number of participants for this? Yesterday it was, it went more than 210. Oh, good. Very good. On an average, it was around 120, maybe, on an average. Yes, roughly. roughly. That's this a good number. In the uh, speakers. Yeah, yeah. Morning, Swankar ji, Sanjeev here. Good morning, Sanjeev ji. Uh, Professor Yusuf is here. And uh, Sanjeev ji is the Dean of uh, Punjab Engineering College. I also know Dr. Malik. I attended oh. his uh, short term course at IIT Roorkee in December 2018. Ah, okay. He's one of the uh, finest in uh, thin film things. Hello. Professor Mahanti, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, Professor Mahanti. You are, he's muted, I think. Professor Mahanti, you are muted. Hi, everybody. Hi. Hi Hello. Good morning. Good morning. Yes. Good morning. Good evening to you all, sir. <laughs> <laughs> yes. How is the weather there? Beautiful. Nice and warm. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Mumbai is very pleasant. Particular night you feel like, you know. Yes. Yeah. But Rurki must be also Rurki is still a bit cold, but it's better than uh, it's, than Jan I mean February. This time it was really severe cold during the January yeah. and uh, early February. But now I think same in Chandigarh and Mohali as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Chandigarh, it was terrible. It went down to two. Oh, yeah. I see. <laughs> yeah, it has, but now it has become warm, warmer. And, uh, and this is also very unusual. Yeah, during this time of year, it is not usually that hot. Yes. Yeah, I think that February is very nice and rookie, okay, if I remember. Yes, usually. 
All set. And are you in Didi, Bangalore or where are you, Didi? Good morning. I'm definitely here. Okay. Didi, you are muted. Yeah, I'm just looking for the right microphone. Just give me half a second because I think. Okay, now it's okay. Can you hear? Me? Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, now, yeah. It is, now it is fine. Good morning. Okay. Morning, morning. Sorry. Got a little late. How many? About 300 people? Uh, a lot of people are attending. Some You're muted, sir. You're Hi, muted. Sampath. Hello, Professor Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, good morning. everybody. Sampath, where are you? In California, in the US, or in India? I am in New Bombay. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Mumbai, rather Mumbai. Mumbai, Mumbai. Mumbai. <laughs> close, close to Yusuf. <laughs> Mothering more. To, I, right I, now I'm more. Hi, Amar, how are you? Right, yeah, I'm fine. Right now I'm uh, more closer because I'm uh, joining from home. Okay. So, you know, oh, yeah, great. Uh, just two kilometers. Three, three kilometers. Yeah, yeah, two kilometers. Hey, Yalga, you have had a very close haircut. It looks like you have cut the hair for the next one year. Hi, <laughs> Yalga. I bought off. Hello. The, Good morning. During, after pandemic, the very first haircut I got standing, you know, and standing outside the, <laughs> the <laughs> salon. He was not ready to cut. I said, I'll, if you can cut, just, uh, you know, do it. Yeah. Okay, now it is nine o'clock, so we should wait for a few minutes, right? Uh, yeah, let's wait for a few minutes. The students, uh, I think number is uh, increasing. So maybe five minutes. Yeah, five minutes. Hi, Kalu, how are you? Hi, Kalu. Yes, hello. Good morning. He is still adjusting his settings. Hey. His speaker is not on yet, it looks like. Where are you Didi, now? At homes. You can see the beautiful office behind me. <laughs> <laughs> That's a, uh, I can change that office with a click of the mouse. I can't get any sound. <laughs> I don't know why. You can make an ocean. Yeah. <laughs> there's a there's a background. I so I can be standing inside the middle of the galaxy and giving the talk. <laughs> there are these beautiful backgrounds. <laughs> so, so this is a virtual office. But yesterday Ramesh was in the same office. <laughs> <laughs> Somehow I'm missing out the joke, but uh, I cannot hear anything. Is there any problem in sound? I think I think Carlo is continuing his student habits. He doesn't want to listen to me. You know, if you go for virtual, <laughs> if you go for everything virtual, then I don't know whether you have uh, watched that movie, Robert, Robert for uh, Rajinikanth Robert. Yeah. Then you know what will happen. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> Shubhankar Kalur is having difficulty. He can't have speaker, it seems. His speaker is not working. Sadaza, can you hear us? No, he cannot. His speaker, tell him to log out and log in through chat or through phone call. Him. <clears throat> Indroda is also here. Oh, Indro is there. Hi, Indro. You're muted. Hello. Yes, you have an excellent office, Didi. Yes, uh, Ramesh had it yesterday, so I thought... Okay, I'd no, I know that, yeah. Yeah. No. <laughs> That's what we were joking. I mean, I had an option of also standing <laughs> in the <laughs> room and giving the talk. Actually, what problem is it? Our... Are you able to hear Carlo, I guess. Yeah, yeah, but Carlo okay. is not able okay. to hear us. 
Okay. So he complained loudly in between that he can't hear what the jokes I'm cracking because he saw everybody laughing. As soon as the stars will go for breakfast. Pardon? The advantage of uh, participating online. Yeah. Because switch on video and take breakfast. Switch on video and go for anything. Nobody knows. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, Hello. 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 is also uh, here. Today. We don't disappear. We are listening to your talk. We are sitting here and we are giving you out. That's all. <laughs> I mean, for virtual meetings, it will be the speaker who will ask the audience questions. Okay, tell me, what was there on slide number 17? <laughs> <laughs> No, said the Subankar Vedanto said something well that uh, in virtual you you at least can feel that everybody is listening to you. <laughs> Kaluda, can you hear us? Okay, maybe I'll try out the sharing because I don't debate much. Uh, Subankar, can I try out the sharing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> Can you see my screen? Yes, yes. Okay. Yes. Only your screen is not taking the full width. Probably the ratio. Yeah, as per ratio, but let me not change it now because if I try to change it, it will be a problem. Also, my is that, laser pointer is, is very small. This is just for this information. If you use 16 by 19, then everything okay, should be okay, fine. Okay. But right now, I will not yeah, risk yeah. anything. Not to disturb. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I think we, we can start now. Nine five. Yeah, yeah, maybe we should start because there are people from different time zones. So. Uh, let's begin this. Uh, hello everyone, uh, let's begin this session. And I uh, request Professor uh, SM Yusuf to chair this session. And uh, yes. Uh... Uh, very good, uh, all of you. And this is really my privilege to chair this session. And I must thank uh, all the organizers, particularly Professor B.P. for inviting me and for this uh, initiative actually the quantum matter heterostructures conference going on very well last year also i attended it it was at iop bhuvaneshwar and i congratulate all the organizers for keeping this series alive because that is very very important considering the importance of the subject in uh, today's scenario okay, not only nationally but internationally and this is one area which has which a really good future <laughs> and uh, not only the scientific part but it it will lead to technological developments as you, all of you know so and today you know that galaxy of speakers are lined up and uh, first uh, talk will be the plenary talk that will be delivered by professor dd sharma and then uh, we have three uh, invited talks invited talks are for half an hour as you know and but this plenary talk for 45 minutes and none of the speakers uh, they need any introduction because all of you know them for their uh, great contribution to the scientific uh, field in their respective areas. So with this short introduction, it is my pleasure to invite Professor D.D. Sarma to deliver the plenary talk. And he will be talking uh, about the space result photoelectron spectroscopy to probe heterostructures. So we are starting five minutes late. That means this will end at nine. 50 including discussion so if you kindly keep about uh, seven minutes or so for discussion that will be nice thank you thank you very much for the kind introduction and i also thank the organizers for inviting me to this very important 
conference, <clears throat> as already mentioned by Professor Yusuf, it's a very different, very important area, and I congratulate the organizers for putting together a very, very impressive uh, list of speakers and program. As I've already stated, that what I'm going to talk about, and I'll go uh, as I go along, I'll define what I am saying. Uh, I'll be talking about two different kinds of space resolved photoelectron spectroscopy. And I'll show how they're very important in understanding in great detail uh, and get insight into heterostructures, electronic properties. Uh, before I start, let me point out our research over the years, because what I'm going to present to you is a culmination of uh, two decades of work. And uh, over this period, we have had support, general support from Navigation, as well as uh, CRB and Department of Science and Technology all in the government of India. I also had private funding, very generous funding from Jamshed Jitata Trust for our own research over the last three years or so. Uh, there are two kinds <coughs> of uh, space resolution I'll be talking about. They're fundamentally different from each other. So right in, the, right in the beginning, let me point out that one space resolution is going to be layer resolved, which will be a vertical direction space resolution, which is not the conventional direction that a microscopy would give you the space resolution. The more conventional way of doing the space resolution is a lateral resolution. And that is the second part of my talk. In the first part of my talk, I'll show you that there can be a vertical resolution that can be achieved by photo emission spectroscopy. <clears throat> and with this first technique, I'll be addressing two different systems, two different heterostructures, very uh, well celebrated, well known, STO LAO structure, as well as STO LTO structures. And these two, for those of you, very few who may not know about these systems, are fundamentally different in the sense that the first heterostructure is built on band insulator with a band insulator on top. So the interface is between two band insulators, whereas the second example is a band insulator and mod insulator. And that brings in some fundamental changes in the physics, as I'll be showing you as I go. The main players in the first part of the talk uh, that I'm going to talk about with this vertical resolution that I mentioned are going to be a series of students of many generations. As I said, this is culmination of uh, nearly two decades of activities. So many, many PhD students, most of whom are not in the group any longer. Shumanta Mukherjee, Banabed Paul, Banabed is now Stuart Parkin doing his PhD. Shumanta is still in the group. Debra Chaudhary is a faculty member in IIT Kharagpur, Palai Satra, who is a faculty member at SENS in Bangalore, Angshuman Nag, a faculty member at ISA Pune, Avijit Hazarika, a faculty member at uh, IICT Hyderabad. I have been very fortunate uh, to collaborate with several people because the work that I'm going to talk about necessarily requires synchrotron radiation. And the synchrotron radiation that I've used extensively are at Petra, Besi, as is Electra for some of the earlier work that I'll not be talking about. And our partners are from Petra, Wolfgang Drube and his group members, Besi, Mihaela Gorgoy, in Uppsala University that you've been extensively collaborating with, Olaf Karras and his group members. The samples, uh, this particular we will not be talking about. We have published something at Magnetic Tunnel Junction, came from Johan Okraman, and LOS2 comes from Jobu Matsuno, Hide Takagi, uh, from Riken Group and the S2 L2 come from Jack Chakalian and his group members at Frankfurt. So let me get started with a brief introduction of what I'm going to talk about. The main difficulty in investigating an interface, an interface by definition, is actually some things are typically buried at a depth because except for an interface that we uh, can define with respect to vacuum or air on one side and sample on the other that is the surface of the sample most of the heterostructure that we are interested in actually is between two materials so it is necessarily below a particular material and it's very thin because interface if it is ideally made has no vertical dimension at all it only has a lateral dimension which implies that any volume averaging technique that you might use to look at the property of that very thin interface will have very small signal because the signal, any signal that comes from all the volume averaging technique will be coming from all over the samples. So the actual signal that you're interested in of the heterostructure, which is tied to the interface, will be a very small proportion and so you'll not be able to see. So that's the reason why you need to have space resolution a microscopic technique of some sort 
which will be more focused. You should be able to focus down onto the interface and get the property of that interface out. And that's the idea. But as I said, that you need to have a vertical uh, direction simply because, uh, for example, I mean, if you want to do a TEM of a heterostructure of the kind LOS2 that I've talked about, what you would do is actually make a cross-sectional TEM, but cross-sectional TEM essentially introduces another boundary that is because you vertically cut the sample perpendicular to the interface, and then you have another this sample and the vacuum interface that you are introduced so that you can look at the interface from the side. That doing, first of all, you are averaging over the interface along this direction and seeing the interface as a line, but you also have to do an invasive cut of the sample. Ideally, what you would like to do is to come vertically down and look at the interface from the top so that you don't do introduce any invasive technique. So you want to do it in a non-invasive way. How can one do that? And what I'd like to show you that high energy photo emission can do this with exceedingly uh, beautifully because it has tunable surface sensitivity. And let me introduce that idea very briefly. Before that, photoelectron spectroscopy, all of you know, but just to remind you very quickly what it is, you have the sample with its energy levels, the energy increases in this direction, there are deep core levels that are characteristic of the element. So looking at the core level, you know which element you are looking at. And what you do is to come in with a monoenergetic photons, you knock electrons out, these electrons go out, you measure their kinetic energies. You know the photon energy, H nu that come in with, and the kinetic energy of the electron that goes out. You can map out also the valence band and therefore study the electron extraction. So you can know the elemental concentration by looking at the intensities of the core level, and you can map out the valence band structure with high resolution, high energy resolution, and the the is the quantity that is defined as the binding energy of the level from which you're pulling the electron out. And that it simply says the kinetic energy measured with respect to the firm energy of the sample. If that you have to, the firm energy must be equal to kinetic energy plus binding energy, less than the total energy. I've written as H to minus kinetic energy. So what to measure is the kinetic energy. Total energy and the binding energy. That's the basic idea. Now, the one very important aspect is to note that this kinetic energy of the electron that's coming out is rather small. It's typically in the range of one electron volt to thousand or two thousand or five thousand electron volt. In this energy range for the electron, electrons cannot come out without suffering scattering, inelastic scattering, where it loses the energy. If it loses the energy, then the energy conservation law that I showed you is lost, and then that photoelectron signal will not be contributed by such electrons that are inelastically scattered. So we collect essentially those electrons, carry information for in photoelectron spectroscopy, which do not undergo any inelastic transition. <clears throat> so what is the probability? that the electron will come out without uh, suffering any inelastic scattering is measured in terms of a length scale, escape depth shown over here as a function of the kinetic energy because it, it critically depends on the energy with which the electron is coming out. But remember, this escape depth that depends on electron energy, but electron kinetic energy in photo emission is nothing but the photon energy minus the binding energy. The binding energy of the level that I'm looking at is fixed. That's fixed by the property of the material. But I can vary the photon energy. As I systematically vary the photon energy, I'm systematically varying the kinetic energy. And as I increase the photon energy, I'll increase the kinetic energy of the electron. And if I'm in the regime of kinetic energies here, then by in increasing photon energy, you can see along this curve, I'll be increasing the escape depth. That means as I increase the photon energy, I'm looking, getting electrons coming from deeper into the sample if I'm looking at the top of the sample. And that immediately tells you what the advantage would be. And here is a schematic way to make you understand what we are talking about. Think of two alloy systems. One is a homogeneous alloy, so that it is represented by a single color. But there is another alloy which from the top going down, its composition is changing. And that's why the color is changing. Color represents somehow the composition. here. Now imagine that I'm looking at from top and then coming with a very low photon energy such that electrons are coming out only from this top layer. Let's say if you angstrom, two angstrom or three angstrom. 
Then I'll see the composition comp corresponding to the red here, composition corresponding to the red here. But imagine that I increase the photon energy by a little amount, then of course I'll get electrons coming out from before uh, deeper down into the material. And I can systematically change my photon energy step by step, cutting into the sample like this. And obviously the result that I get here and here, the two, if I take the difference between the two, then I get exactly the information content in this law. Actual reality is slightly different. You have to model it a bit more because it is not that the electrons, all electrons from this level come out and every electron below it does not come out. There's an exponential dependence or probability of that electron coming out without suffering in elastic scattering. But you know how to mathematically model that. And therefore, by systematically changing the photon energy, I get cuts into vertical direction, looking deeper in and getting what is the elemental composition at any layer as I keep probing inside, as well as the electronic structure. The, I get the compositional information from the looking at the core level, as I pointed out, and by looking at the valence band, how I change the valence band as I increase the photon energy by looking deeper inside, I know how the electronic structure at any given layer looks like. And this is the technique that we are going to do. And as I've pointed out, this we have been working for the last uh, two decades and on a very wide variety of systems. I'll not go into the details of that, but point out that once we come to this particular system, a couple of papers that are published sometimes back, and I'll tell you what we find in this particular system. This is our sample. This is the cross-sectional TEM that I had mentioned about. We have STO down here, LTO, LAO up here, lanthanum aluminate, and then we uh, we uh, look at the properties of this. There's a six layer sample. As you know, strontium titanate is of course a very high band gap insulator. Lanthanum aluminate is a higher band gap insulator. And when I create this interface between the two, it turns out very surprisingly, and this has really got the fancy of the community very widely, it can give rise to high mobility metal, which under certain circumstances can give rise to certain activity and even magnetism. So the question is, what does it? The how come I put two band gap insulators, which are band insulators simply, and there's no magnetism, but I end up getting magnetism, superconductivity, high mobility metal. What's going on? Where is it coming from? And what we are going to do is to exactly look down from the top and make sure that what do I see compositionally? First of all, do I actually have this ideal case of lanthanum aluminate up on top on strontium titanate? Do they mix up a little? Because I know if lanthanum gets doped into strontium titanate, then it makes it metal. That is known from the bulk physics. I don't have to have heterostructure for that. So is that an intermix? And how is the electronic structure or electron properties uh, distributed? What makes it metallic? How is that metallic electron, that free charge carrier density, distributed as I look deeper inside by changing the photon energy and looking inside? And this, though I have taken in the first example round objects, it works very well uh, on a planar subject. So imagine that that's my lanthanum aluminate at top, strontium titanate below. There's a region of interface which may also be changing its characteristic as the interface goes towards the bulb. And I'm going to come with low photon energy so that I look at lanthanum aluminate mainly. This is a lanthanum peak uh, or al lanthanum peak, and this is a strontium peak. As I increase my photon energy and look deeper inside, my strontium peak intensity goes up, lanthanum uh, peak intensity uh, goes down. Here I have normalized to the lanthanum peak intensity. This is a schematic just to tell you how what it to expect. So let us get started. Again, reminding you, my heterostructure has lanthanum aluminate on top and strontium titanate below. I'm going to look at the lanthanum core level and strontium core level. And as I increase the photon energy, I'll see more and more strontium. So if I increase the photon energy, more strontium I see, lanthanum intensity relatively will go down. Basically, strontium by lanthanum intensity should go down as I increase the photon energy. And that is precisely what you see. 
have plotted the data of lanthanum 3D core level intensity normalized by the strontium 3D core level intensity as a function of the photon energy. And you can see indeed this ratio of intensity is going down, telling me that lanthanum aluminate is on top, strontium titanate below, but I didn't have to do this complicated experiment going to a synchrotron radiation to tell me that lanthanum is on top, strontium below, because that's how I've made the sample. And also my cross-sectional TEM did show me that lanthanum aluminate is on top and strontium titanate. My interest is to know at this interface, do I have intermixing across lanthanum and strontium? Can I extract that from this information? It turns out that this intensity variation, besides the fact qualitatively see that it is going down and so lanthanum is on top and strontium below, I can model it and find out what is the expected intensity ratio variation as a function of photon energy if I had six monolayers of lanthanum aluminate on top as this sample is. This number six represents that by intention, by my design, I wanted to make six LAO layers on top of SD. And then I can calculate and figure out how it is. And so I calculate for different thicknesses of lanthanum aluminate, what the expected theoretical ratio should be, and that I show over here. And you can see this top brown line is for a 2.9 nanometer thick lanthanum aluminate. And this dark line at the bottom is 2.6 nanometer, and that covers all the experimental data points, saying that this technique can pin down your interface thickness or the thickness of the LO layer on top between 2.6 and 2.9 nanometer, which is a 0.3 nanometer, so plus minus 0.15 nanometer. 1.5 angstrom thickness uncertainty at the most. But of course, we being the practitioner believe that actual error is even smaller. All the experimental data points can be described by those which are between 2.8 and 2.7 nanometer, so plus minus 0.05 nanometer. I can pin down and it says that I have an extremely sharp interface with hardly any kind of extremely sharp interface of LAO on top of STO with hardly any intermixing. We put a limit of intermixing of lanthanum strontium to less than one unit cell. So that we can eliminate the possibility that there is intermixing given rise to the metallic state. But then what makes it metallic? It turns out that we, when you look at the core level of titanium, this huge big peak that you see over here is coming from titanium 4 plus, which is a strontium titanate signal as you would expect. This is the P3 half and this is the P half. Let's not worry about that. It's just a spin orbit replica of this. one. But it is not the single signal. I see that my metallic signals also have this bump at lower binding energy, which is because of titanium 3 plus state. Titanium 3 plus state tells me that there's one electron in the conduction band of titanium 3D. That tells me this is the one that is making the system metallic. And so now what I can do is to look at the intensity of this particular intensity, normalized by this titanium 4 plus signal, and look at its uh, intensity, how it varies with the photon energy. That means as I increase the photon energy, I'm looking deeper down and trying to figure out this titanium 3 plus, is it at the interface or is it below? Where exactly is the titanium 3 plus that the electron that makes the system conducting? How is it distributed in this heterostructure? And that is what we are going to do next. And these are the experimental data points of titanium 3 plus to titanium 4 plus for two different samples. One is a six layer and there is four layer in it. Now we need to analyze this. It tells me that the very fact that the intensity is going up as I increase the photon energy tells me that the titanium 3 plus is relatively speaking towards the interface and its intensity decreases as I go deeper into the sub substance into ST. But in order to know exactly how it is distributed, we have to model and we take different models and calculate what is the expected variation and comp comparing with the experimental result to find out what kind of electron distribution, charge carrier distribution of this extra 3D electron of titanium would be compatible with experimentally what we observe. And if we imagine that there is uh, the charge, this extra charge density, titanium 3D electrons are tied to the interface with whatever thickness, but is starting from the interface and is going down with uniform concentration, the best fit that I can get is given by this black line. And experimental data is here and it shows 
that if interface, imagine that my charge carrier density is tied to the interface with one simple distribution, there's no way I can describe my experimental validation. So if I imagine that, let it not be at the interface, let it be anywhere, a constant distribution anywhere in the ST. This is the best that I can describe and it still doesn't fit my experimental data at all, which tells me that with one single distribution, I cannot fit the experimental variation. It turns out I, I need two, minimum two different kinds of electron distribution. And the electron distribution that fits it very well and the fitting is given by the green curve going through the experimental data, you can see is shown over here. Let me tell you what it is. This gray part is lanthanum aluminate. This is the surface of the sample. And this is looking into the surface of the sample. This part is strontium titanate. So your interface is here, which is sharp, as you have already established. And then I see that the distribution that is compatible or this green distribution tells me that I need an electron distribution tied to the interface with a rather narrow width of a nanometer or less of the density of 20 to 10 to the power 14 per square centimeter which is the expected density that one would uh, think from various considerations. But along with that, we find there's a very low electron density distributed, which can be evaluated in terms of per unit cell as a doping of electrons of about 0 0.06 electron per unit cell. And that also is critical to describe my experimental data. The same thing is true for the 4UC, and I'll not uh, belabor the point, but the numbers are similar and similar description comes. But what is the origin of this electron distribution? Of course, there are many kind of uh, expectations, many theories have been discussed, many scenarios have been discussed. What I'm going to talk about is that oxygen vacancy, because it turns out that you have a spectroscopic signature of oxygen vacancy, and you can map out oxygen vacancy, how it is distributed. There are very good reasons to expect that oxygen vacancy plays an important role, may play an important role from the physics of strontium titanate that we know for many years, as well as for, from the fact that the, how these samples behave depend critically on how they're annealed in oxygen uh, uh, atmospheres. Now, I'm not showing you the experimental result, but directly telling you how the oxygen vacancy signature varies experimentally. Those are these red data points. And again, simulated data that fits the distribution well is given by the green. <clears throat> and the model that works to describe the oxygen vacancy claims that there's a more or less constant oxygen vacancy all through strontium titanate. Not very surprising. Strontium titanate is known to have oxygen vacancy rather easily. And there is a, right at the surface of the lanthanum aluminate, there's some oxygen vacancy. And quantitatively, this oxygen vacancy here is about 0.14 oxygen vacancy per unit cell. And remember, every oxygen vacancy gives you two electrons. So this will give you about 0.3 electrons. And 0.3 electrons per unit cell, if it gets transferred to the interface, will be in the order of 20 to about 14 per square centimeter. Likewise, this vacancy that I find throughout the strontium titanate is about 0.01 vacancies per unit cell. That will give me about 0.02 electrons. And the number I get is 0.06 electron in the same ballpark. Remember, these are two completely different independently evaluated quantities. To see them in the same ballpark gives us confidence that it is this oxygen vacancy that gives, it, uh, gives these electron donations. And the fact that this is not in contradiction to the polar catastrophe model in the sense that one would say that the fact that these oxygen vacancy is caused over here to donate the electron here has something to do with the, uh, the what has come in uh, science with what is presupposed in the polar catastrophe model. So basically the system then undergoes after transferring the electrons here because the electrons goes out from the bonding level of the lanthanum aluminate and therefore some oxygens become unstable and leave the surface and therefore there's no charge imbalance and lanthanum aluminate surface is not expected to be then metallic because of hole doping. <clears throat> uh, so uh, this is essentially the summary of what I have just now described to you. I'll not go over it because let me go over to the next one which is actually unpublished result 
Uh, this conclusion I've already told you, so let me not go through that uh, in detail. Uh, this is one point that I have not talked about. Uh, we have looked at the valence band also, and we find the charge carriers are only moderately correlated, as should be expected for lightly doped strontium titanium. So let me go on to talking about this other ACE2A2, and this is an unpublished work. Uh, here we are looking at a MOT insulator, band insulator heterostructure, which is of course different from the band insulator, band insulator that we talked about before. Uh, the main person were, uh, who contributed to this, it was Barnabir Paul's thesis work, and Shamashir Das and Sumanta Mukherjee contributed. There's a collaboration with Jack's group. At uh, that time, they were in the University of Arkansas, now in Rutgers, and Indra Nil Sarkar, and Ulkan Zubay from Petra. It turns out that this particular equation, the electronic structure of such an interesting heterostructure, has been discussed in terms of Q. That's uh, quite expected. <clears throat> what is unexpected is that depending on the theoretical tool that was used, it turns out that the description is very different. This is Okamoto and Andy Millis's work from early on 2004 that uh, using DMFT, and let me tell you what they're doing is showing you layer resolved electronic structure at each of the layers. This top layer is the strontium titanate layers, and these are the lanthanum titanate uh, layers, and this is the interface layer. This is the chemical potential here, and these states here we call the coherent peak. Remember, photo emission will see not this part, only the occupied part, which is on the left. So, photo emission, according to this theory, would see changes in the density of states or the uh, spectral intensity at the Fermi energy increasing over several layers and then decreasing over several layers. And this, what we call the Mott Hubbard sideband or lower Hubbard band has very strong intensity for the L2 deep inside. But as you approach the L from the L2 side, the interface layer, this Mott Hubbard intensity goes down and becomes zero by continuously decreasing. A different uh, theory, so the coherent peak goes up, that incoherent peak goes down in going that direction. And changes happen over many, many layers. Whereas if you look at this one coming from Dagoto's group, here, the interface layer is here, and you can see the changes are very quickly over. The, this is the chemical potential. There is uh, electron density at the interface layer, and that electron density dies out very quickly, unlike in this particular description. And here, the mott Hubbard peak doesn't, here it remains exactly the same energy, but here it changes its energy. And this part, of course, we will not see. Let's not talk about that. So in this case, it is almost entirely tied to the uh, interface layer. Here it changes over many layers. Here the Mott Hubbard peak changes its intensity over many layers. Here it doesn't, but here it, the energy changes, here it doesn't. And there are other <coughs> competing uh, calculations. I'll not go into the detail of describing them. I'll show you our results. This is the sample, strontium titanate on top, lanthanum titanate, drone and tam tarbium scandate. <coughs> and there's a valence band. You can see lovely photoelectron spectroscopic data with different kind of photon energy, 3.6, 4.0, 4.4, 5.2, 5.9. And there should not be any problem except for the fact that all spectroscopists know that if there's a very good signal to noise ratio in the spectra, then that is not the part you are interested in. Actually, the part that you're interested in, the D1, is a signal that is out here. It's a very, very weak signal at these high energies. So it's a very demanding experiment. And I am thankful to the students who are extremely patient that collected the data for us to be able to see what it looks like when we expand that part, and that part looks like this. And you can see that there's a systematic chain with the photon energy change that tells me that the electronic structure itself is evolving as I look deeper inside. And by analyzing this data, I'll be able to tell how not only the electron that is mobile, that D1, how it is distributed along the depth, but I'll also be able to tell its character in terms of how correlated it is by looking at its incoherent part, the Mott Hubbard sideband. And this is what we do. First, we look at the intensity of this peak as a function of the oxygen peak here shown. And I'm increasing the intensity. That means I'm looking deeper inside. The intensity is going up of titanium 3D. That means this D1 is distributed below, which as it should be, because lanthanum titan, it has one D electron. And this has no D electron. 
But in order to know if there's anything going on unusual, you have to model and fit this and figure out how exactly the electron distribution is there. And what we find compatible with our experiment is that this is the surface, this is strontium titanate here, this is the interface, and that's LTO. It turns out that LTO dopes electrons into the STO site. This is approximately two nanometer, a one nanometer deep. This is a three nanometer is here, two nanometers. So there's about a nanometer depth of electron doped into the STO site and hole correspondingly doped on the lanthanum titanate site. So the electron distribution behaves in this particular way. Then looking at it, you see that the spectrum is changing in shape as I change. This particular peak, which is high for the 3.6 kilo electron volt, that means when I'm more to looking towards the surface, becomes less. And this one, the Mothabert sideband, becomes more important as I go deeper with higher photon energy. That is telling me these electrons are less correlated. These electrons are more correlated because as I look deeper inside, Mott Hubbard band becomes more important and coherent intensity becomes less important. But I can in fact extract out exactly how the coherent peak and the incoherent peak intensities are changing. And that is what I'm going to show you next. Uh, beyond this qualitative statement that as I look deeper inside, I see it increasingly correlated, more correlated. Here I've extracted for you that from the experiment, the coherent in intensity in blue and the Mott Hubbard sideband, the incoherent intensity in red, layer resolved. And you can see this is the Andy Millis Okamoto paper. It replicates this rather well, except for the fact that the distribution is even more gentle compared to what we see here. Here you see, as I go from the LTO side, the Mott Hubbard intensity should decrease. From the LTO side, as I'm going towards the interface, the Mott Hubbard intensity is decreasing. The, it, the coherent feature intensity should first increase and then should decrease because remember, I'm looking at that small part. It first increases and then decreases. It's highest at the interface. It's highest at the interface region. It is exactly the same description that you have found here. And quantitatively also, if I map out the coherent intensity, which is this green part, I'd shown you earlier, this is the total electron density, how it is distributed. And this is how the coherent to incoherent intensity ratio varies. And the same thing can be compared with the calculation. Calculation had symmetrized the sample, so we can ignore that part. And you see that the total electron density behaves this way, which is to be compared with this line. And the coherent intensity is this one that is to be compared with this one, except for, as you can see that here, the distribution is over a little longer range of distances than is predicted by this. In the last five minutes or so, let me quickly give you a feel for this more conventional way of doing photoelectron spectroscopy with a lateral resolution. This is the technique that we had used on CMR long, long time back in collaboration with Sanguk Chang, but uh, more recently we are looking at this metastable state in few layered MOS2. Several papers we have published, I'll not be talking about that, uh, but I'll be talking about the heterostructure because this is a conference on heterostructure, but quickly tell you that this metastable state uh, can be in many different crystallographic form, T, T prime, T double prime, T triple prime, et cetera using this technique, basically it forms in small patches. Imagine that you have an MOS2, which has some stable form, which is the H form, and some unstable form T form, which is this little green part here, and the gray part is the stable form. Normal photoemission spectroscopy will come with a wide beam and it will eliminate the sample, sample and also the sample holder. You'll get signal from everywhere and you'll get this complex signal. Instead of doing that, if I come in with the photo energy and put a lens in front of it and narrowly bend it, then I can get the photo electron spectroscopy. Uh, there's a, uh, uh, there's a uh, somebody's uh, microphone is on. Uh, if you can mute it. Yeah, I, I request uh, I request all others to mute the microphones, please, except speaker. Thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, so if it is tightly bunched and you can focus it on the green, then you get the green spectrum. And then you can place it on the brown and you can get the brown spectrum separately. And here you got the sum of the two. 
So this is the spectral microscopy. You have a lateral resolution because of bunching. The photon and photon can be bunched. It is one of the best beamline in the world that we worked on at Electra. It's 100 nanometers width. And uh, so we figured out that it is actually the T prime phase. We've showed why the system becomes conducting and that also the lithium doping can make it stable. But that is not what I'm going to talk about. What I'm going to talk about is a heterostructure using MOS2. So you take a wafer, which is your substrate on which you're making this heterostructure, and you put an HBN to separate out uh, uh, the boron nitride, which is to separate out any cup into the sodium silicon oxide, silicon, silicon dioxide uh, substrate. And then you put your MOS2 on top of it, and then you make a heterostructure with a graphene on top. <clears throat> And you want to understand because there are a lot of very interesting claims on this system. As you can see that there is a compressive strain and this compressive strain may drive the 2H form of MOS2 into one of the T forms that we, I was mentioning and that's why I wanted to show you that. And there are many, many claims. We looked at this particular problem and we also saw that yes, there is a strain that can be measured by Raman. I'm not going to show you that here, that there is approximately a 1.2% compressive strain on the heterostructure that we looked at directly looking at the electronic structure. But before that, this is my heterostructure. This is a schematic diagram, looks very beautiful. We can make it look as beautiful depending on how good a graphic uh, uh, system, software system you have. But when you look at it, it's AC and trying to answer what your sample is, this is what you see. This is very non descript Actually, this is a molybdenum disulfide dotted and the graphene is sitting like this. There's some more molybdenum disulfide. Oh, this is boron nitrate. You can't figure out anything what is where. Using the spectro microscopy because you are elemental sensitive, I can map out what is the element where the intensity of boron one is, is. And when I do that, I see this. You can see the lead still, but lead has no boron. It's actually an artifact because I'm not correcting for the background contribution. So if I measure only the peak intensity, subtracting out the background, which I'll do now, then I get rid of these and I see exactly where boron is spread. This dark part where you don't see boron is where the molybdenum disulfide is sitting. And in fact, this shaded part you can see here where you can see a little bit of the boron like this, that's a graphene piece sitting. I can take the carbon signal and I'll see only the graphene then, and I'll see the molybdenum 3D, and that is what I'm going to show you next, map of molybdenum 3D. And I see exactly where molybdenum 3D is sitting. And this little less intensity of molybdenum 3D is where the graphene is. Now, if I'm interested in the electronic structure of, let's say, the heterostructure, I can put my photon beam at, on any of these points, ACB, as I've pointed out here. This is where the lead comes in, the probe lead comes in. If I want to know what happens to molybdenum disulfide, which is not under the heterostructure, I can put my probe at E or F, as I've shown here and here. And we take actual data from these points that I have marked and try to understand what's going on. And that is what is shown next. There are two samples. I'll only show you about this, this S1 sample and not the other sample because it is the same information. We find that whenever we choose A, C or B, which is the heterostructure, molybdenum disulfide, I'm looking at molybdenum 3D signal under the graphene, it is the solid lines. Whenever I see away from the graphene, E and F, these are the dash dotted lines, they're at a lower binding energy. And it doesn't matter whether you look at molybdenum 3D or sulfur 2P, it's exactly the same description. There's a green, blue line, sky blue line, which you can hardly see, is from the reference to its structure, which tells me that it's at exactly the same line shape all of them have. It's actually H phase everywhere. There's no trace of T phase in any of this. So the speculation that the, the compressive stress drives MOS2 into the T phase, one of the T phases is wrong. But there is a large shift that you can see, 0.4 electron volt, 0.4 electron volt. In this sample also approximately similar shifts we see. And remember, it cannot be because of a charge transfer from sulfur to molybdenum because then they would have shifted in different direction, but the sense of shift is always the same. Heterostructure has a higher binding energy of about 0.4 electron volt. Not only heterostructure, we have looked at the valence band also, I'll, since I'm running out of time and I want to leave some time for discussion. It turns out that even in the valence band, this is the part which is not from the heterostructure. This is the part from the heterostructure and that also is separated by approximately 
0.4.5 electron volt. So basically, it is a question of referencing of the energy. As we know, the photoemission always references to the local Fermi energy. All that is happening is the local Fermi energy is changing between the heterostructure and the part which is away from the heterostructure. What we conclude is that though there's a compressive strain on molybdenum disulfide on the graphene, there's no transformation of the H phase to the T phase or any of its variants. Because we know what the T phase looks like from the detailed study that I didn't uh, tell you, but uh, are already published. In absence of the graphene, away from the graphene, the chemical potential is really pinned by the defect bands of equals two. There are always some defects, but when you bring in the graphene, now the chemical potential is pinned by the graphene, which lies about 0.4 electron volt above the top of the defect state, and that's why it shifts by 0.4 electron volt. And with that, let me end my talk thanking you for your patience. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor D.D. Sarma, for an excellent presentation, bringing out the novelty of this photoelectron spectroscopy and as a function of depth, how it can nicely, very precisely, fraction of a nanometer length scale vertically uh, resolved uh, technique, it can, inter it can probe the interface. Yeah. what is happening in the interface and uh, thank you so much thank for the with the great clarity and bringing out the importance of this technique and highlighting the physics aspects uh, involving electron spectroscopy now it is open for uh, discussion questions and comments are welcome Hello, I can your, hear sound, you. your sound level is not good. You have to increase the level. Uh, no, it is. We are, you are not audible. No, Carlo, you must be asking a very tough question because it's getting censored. <laughs> <laughs> I suggest, Carlo, you type in uh, in the chat box while others ask the question and we can come back. We can see yeah, your question. Okay, okay. Yeah. Yeah. We'll come back to you. Now, uh, there's a question from Dinesh. Yeah, please go ahead. Hello. Hello, Didi. This is Dinesh here. Hi. Yes. Uh, so I have a... It... Is it me only that the question are getting censored? Because even his question is getting... Same, same is the problem. <laughs> <laughs> I can hear it so right <laughs> Now it is better. Now yeah, it is yeah. better. Please keep the microphone closer to you. Okay. I had the closest. Okay. It is better. Now it is good. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, did he, uh, it was a nice talk. It was really nice. Uh, so I had a question on your first part of the talk, uh, where you have, where you map the uh, oxygen vacancies, uh, and uh, you say that uh, the oxygen vacancies in the thin film or the substrate they are transferred to the interface to make it, you know, to have a very unique property. So I, I had a question that why these oxygen vacancies are transferred to the sub uh, to the interface? Uh, is there any? Yeah, uh, uh, it turns out that actually, uh, yeah, if I mean we just found that out later uh, after we uh, finished this work, etc. That there are a couple of very good uh, theory uh, that was done. One was little old, and another was from Jejun Yu. Uh, it turns out energetically it's stable, but I can give you a physically physical argument. Think of that, uh, you have this dipolar field that's building up in LAO, which drives the valence band to be of LAO above the conduction band of SDO. And so half an electron gets transferred to the interface, the classic polar catastrophe model. Right? And you have got this half an electron at the interface, but you have half an electron deficit in the LAO layer, in the topmost LAO layer. Remember also, nobody has seen the topmost LAO layer by any technique to be conducting. So that is a very important question that has never been asked very seriously openly. 
Now, these electrons that came out are the valence band electrons of the oxygen P. Mm -hmm. That destabilizes the chemical bonding of the oxygen with lanthanum aluminate. Mm -hmm. And so it finds it easier, some oxygens, because it has no bonding electrons, it has donated, so it goes off exactly the number of electrons that are required to be transferred. And that is a lower energy state then. Mm -hmm. So basically, the propensity of oxygen leaving LAO, normally LAO doesn't like to lose oxygen, mm -hmm. STO does, but LAO does not, is because you're taking electrons out from the valence layer, from the top layer, topmost layer, and so the vacancies get created there. Okay. So that's a physical Yeah, so, uh, okay. Thank now you. this... Uh, so Maiti, Kalvar Maiti has uh, put a question in the chat box. I can read it out or yeah, please. Um, Professor Dijeson also can read it out. Yeah, how okay. the electronic structure at the interface depends on the specific layer meeting. I mean, there are many possibilities. TI, milk, LAO or ELO layers. Does this, the properties been... depend on sample preparation? Absolutely. Uh, this is, a, a, we have not investigated it different kinds, but it is very well known that if you took other kind of terminations, then you don't get this physics. So it's, a, there's a lot of work in there, Carlo, I can discuss it and send you references, that depending on what kind of termination you use, the properties are very strongly influenced. But we looked at only one kind, which is known to give rise to these interesting properties. I have a quick question. You talked about yeah. the magnetism, origin of magnetism, but then you didn't touch upon the origin of yeah. magnetism. Is it very related good. to very frequency good. or, uh, you know? No, very good question, Yusuf. And uh, since there are many real experts of heterostructure and oxide heterostructure is there, I would like to point out one thing to start answering the question. That one thing you have to understand that we are looking at uh, okay, if we are looking, uh, Aninda has a uh, Aninda Bhattacharya uh, has a comment which I look at, at a very low concentration. I mean, if you take the sample and anneal it in oxygen to get rid of oxygen vacancies, and that is how oxygen vacancies got rid of in STU, you can get to very low concentration metallic regime. We do not see anything. I have those data and I didn't draw your attention to that. We don't see it falls below the detection level of photo emission. So photo emission is limited to the high concentration, high carrier density samples. When the carrier density is very low, well below, let's say 5 into 10 to the power 13 per square centimeter, where the magnetism and many other interesting properties show up, we are completely blind to that regime because I don't see any signal. It's too low for us to see. Okay. So we are not commenting on that. All our samples are high carrier concentration samples. But I, in, in a talk, I can stick my neck out. And in, in the paper, it clearly stated that high carrier concentration samples will be Stick my neck out, and I would think that this physics will still be prevalent. But what would happen at really, what makes it special is if you have very low density, what kind of effects will localize some of these dope charge carriers to give rise to magnetism is something that we are not able to prove. But I can speculate. Okay. 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 I think Shubhanka okay. has Thank a question you. and there's a comment from yeah, yeah. Ananda. Yeah, uh, this uh, now question is there from Anand Bhattacharya. Yeah, I, I anticipated this question and uh, sort of answered it that we are blind to the really low density. Anand. So uh, our work is really high charge carrier density. We can see only charge carrier density when it's in the order of you know, more than 3 to 10 to 5 to 10 to 14. And uh, so we are completely unaware of what's going on. You know, but I would expect the same physics would work at even low, because even at the low concentration, once you try to transfer the electron from the top of the layer to the interface, at least theory tells me where I can generate any kind of concentration that it is stabilized by uh, creating an oxygen vacancy. Mm -hmm. There you will not have the distribution of the oxygen vacancy induced electron density throughout the STO bulk that I showed in our sample. 
But the interface thing that one nanometer thick, about 3 to 10 to the power 14 per square centimeter, the electron density that we saw would become lower <coughs> in intensity. And you'll have a, I guess, you'll have a corresponding oxygen vacancy on top of lanthanum and surface. So by changing the oxygen content, what you're really doing is getting rid of this background contribution coming from the bulk is still getting to. That is be my guess. Okay, another question is there from Mr. Vishal from Punjab University. But you have three questions. You can only ask one question, please. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, hello. Yeah. Hello, sir. I am uh, audible, sir. Yes, you are. Hello? Yes, yes. Please yes. Go ahead. Uh, sorry. Uh, thank you for asking me one question. So one question I want to know is, sir, yeah, the range of photon energy you are choosing to get your spectra is depend on what factor and as we normally observe that when we approach toward the higher photon energy, Auger emissions will become more dominant and this will lead to the change in the spectral features. Is that spectral features have consecutively effect on the kind of the signals you are probing layer by layer? Uh, I got your second question more clearly. As you increase the photon energy, indeed, you could uh, uh, change the various cross sections, etc., including that of Auger. Those are taken into account. They don't interfere with the spectrum that you are looking at simply because they appear at totally different energies. Okay, yes, sir. So that doesn't okay. really bother. What was the first part of the question? Sir, uh, first part is the range of photon energy you choose for your experiment that at yeah. the, from start from this photon energy and go up to this photon energy depends on what factors for a particular it depends on the It depends on the synchrotron radiation center where we are or rather the other way around that we look for the synchrotron radiation center that can give us the photon energy that is required to look at the kind of thickness that you are looking at. Remember, the photon energy decides how deep I can see. Okay, so sir. all my studies ended, uh, all my graph ended at about 30 nanometer, and we don't see okay. beyond that because we are limited to about 6, 6.5 kilo electron volt photon energy. Okay, okay. okay so we are already and, four uh, minutes past the schedule time. Hello, we are already four minutes past the schedule time. I can take only one question probably. One more, if okay. someone. Uh, Shubhankar, your question is something that I can see in the chat box. Yes, You're asking yes, what is the please. carrier density of 6 ml NOSTO by Hall. Those are the numbers given our, in our uh, paper. I, I, you know, it's a 2018, and but the work was done in 2014. So just look up. But these are in the order of, uh, in, I would say, certainly 10 to power 15 range. And the one that was lower, we did look at the uh, of 6 layer with high pressure annealed to make it lower in carrier concentration that one we don't see any titanium three plus signal that tells us what is the limit of the carrier density that we are sensitive to this is all discussed in detail in the paper okay okay so uh, very last question from me you talked about the coherent and incoherent and i believe both are elastic and the origin of incoherent elastic scattering is uh, due to Oh no, I, actually it's not, it's the, this is a, I would say the uh, jargon of the community. These are in that sense of all coherent in the sense that you're asking. There's no inelastic or elastic scattering. Elastic scattering can be there, we don't know, but there's no inelastic scattering. We call it incoherent and coherent in the sense to describe what the wave function looks like. Is the final wave function a band-like wave function that it co contributes to conductivity? or it's a localized like wave function, which is the uh, related to the Mott-Hubbard physics, something getting correlated because of correlation driven, it doesn't contribute to the conductivity, but tries to localize the state. Okay. So okay. we call them incoherent and coherent just for a language purpose. Okay, so with this, thank Professor Sharma for his excellent presentation. Once again. Just, just one okay. second. Yes. Yes. Just one second, may I request all of you to just turn on the video so that we can take a, a screenshot. Yeah, yes. So everybody, could you please turn on your video so that quickly you can take a screenshot. One screenshot will not do, you have to have many screenshots. Yeah, yeah.
and yes. also Don't not only it. that by this shivankar will know who are the people not at the uh, computer they have just switched on and gone <laughs> <laughs> good morning very nice talk thank, thank you then thank you then <laughs> thank you so this is shivankar's way of roll call <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Professor. Sir. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm stopping the video, but I'm going to be around. <laughs> yeah. Move on the next speaker. Next. Sir, sir, sir. Presented by. And he from Material Science at Division of Argon National Lab, and uh, he'll be talking about superconductivity and electronic. and in metallicity at the interface of ktao3 so professor patel yes and you you will be presenting an invited talk and duration half an hour so now it is uh, 1003 okay thank you yeah, thanks thanks so much um, uh, professor so uh, i'm um can can you really hear me uh, is it is this okay yeah very much yeah very much wonderful okay um all right so let me start share this one hope i'm sharing the right thing um all right and let me know if um you can see the right screen here is this the right screen are you looking at just the full screen of the yeah. talk uh, cuz i yes, think it's open right now yeah okay yeah, so yeah. wonderful okay so firstly uh it's a great pleasure to be here and uh thanks to shivankar for the invitation and um um uh, unfortunately you know i'm i'm sorry i couldn't be here in person uh, at this in, at this uh, in india um and um so this work um is now uh, well it's actually more than a year and a half old now it's about the discovery of two dimensional superconductivity and uh, pneumatic electronic states at potassium tantalate 111 interfaces and um you can actually find most of what we have to say today in this paper that just came out and uh there's also an older version on the archive i encourage you to look at that as well it's more or less the same and um and you, this is uh, essentially the agenda uh, there are uh, i'm going to talk about superconductivity and then i'll describe what i mean by nematicity and uh, if i have time i'll speak about some possible origins for this and um and that will be that fairly focused agenda okay Let's see if i can move this Yeah, I can. Okay, there you go. All right, and uh, uh, since I have uh, more slides than I can present, probably uh, I won't get to the end of my talk um, very likely. So I'd like to I'd like to uh, first acknowledge uh, the, the work that was done uh, and my collaborators, uh, the work that was done by Chang Jiang Lu, my postdoc, who, who who grew the films, did a lot of the measurements, and we couldn't have uh, done what we what I'm going to show you without uh, having these really wonderful collaborators, both at Argon. uh beijing uh at, at uh, both cas uh, chinese academy of sciences and peking university and uh, my long term collaborator for electron microscopy at urbana champaign professor john minzo okay so uh the talk is going to be about interfacial superconductivity right and and uh, and by that it means uh, somewhat along the lines for what didi was talking about today uh which is that you take two things that are uh, nominally not superconducting let's say and you stick them together and something interesting happens okay you have something at the interface that's new and different right okay so uh there's LOSTO that you heard about today a uh, uh, very uh, well studied system iron selenide and strontium titanate a uh, very remarkable um remarkably high uh, transition temperature in that system uh and then um uh, in the cuprate system as well people have tried taking uh, um a non superconducting metal and an insulating cuprate put them together and found superconductivity at uh, some uh, temperature like a few tens of kelvin 40 kelvin 50 kelvin all right so but one thing you could say here is that you know uh, at least the examples that i'm showing you and actually most of the examples in literature uh, the these the uh, components that we're using here are adjacent to a superconductor in the sense that if you if you take say sto you dope it you know the bulk it will be superconducting iron selenide well here it's very remarkable it's very high temperature superconductivity whereas iron selenide in of itself is a low temperature superconductor uh in the cuprate system 
uh, uh, here, uh, in fact, uh, lanthanum, uh, doped lanthanum copper oxide, a little bit of strain can also give you uh, TCs very close to this value. Uh, and what I'm going to show you today is an example where uh, the bulk is uh, not superconducting and, and uh, as far as we know, and, uh, and the interface is. Okay. So uh, that's in tantalate for uh, this audience might already be uh, known. Uh, it's as a close cousin of strontium titanate, right? Uh, it's a it's a doped five uh, D insulator, uh, and so there's a band gap of like three point six eV, I think. Uh, and then uh, you know it has a dielectric constant that, that that does something very similar to what strontium titanate does. As you cool it down, the dielectric constant sort of rises um, and uh, pretty steeply to a value of about uh, four thousand five hundred, as you can see on the left. And, uh, and if you do manage to dope this, and this was done way back when, in the 1960s actually, uh, about at the same time that STO was being studied, uh, and Bell Labs, what they showed was that if you, you know, chose the right conditions and grew your sample such that it was doped, um, you would get mobilities, uh, you get electrons, and you get mobilities that are quite high, like, like 10,000 in the bulk, right? But there's a line in that, in that paper, uh, so 1965 paper, if you go read it, it says, a uh, reduction of insulating KTO in hydrogen was attempted at 1,000 degrees centigrade, okay? The reaction rate was very slow, however, and only a very thin surface layer appeared to be affected after several hours of exposure. A little different from STO, okay? If you did, did this to STO, uh, it would turn black, all right? Uh, and so, so, uh, um, so KTO is a little harder to reduce, and for those of you who are growers, you should go check the Lincoln diagram for these things, and you'll see what I mean. Um, so, uh, potassium tantalate and strontium titanate, uh, being that they are both, uh, you know, cubic perovskites and uh, uh, are T2G, they, you, you, you know, all the electrons reside in the T2G levels, right? There, as you know, it's sort of an analog of uh, the, the whole like states of gallium arsenide, the valence states of gallium arsenide, uh, but, you know, upside down. So, you've got uh, J equals half uh, spin split off band and, and, and J equals three half uh, manifold. Uh, they're separate from each other by the um, by the spin orbit uh, uh, splitting, uh, that number is very small in strontium titanate of the order of 20 electron volts. Uh, in uh, KTO, it's very high; it's about uh, uh, 400 milli electron volts. Okay, so uh, so this is very nice. And so, if you're interested in spintronics, like like I am, and many others are, uh, uh, you know, you might be very interested in looking at the system because uh, you know you have this very high spin orbit coupling that perhaps you can play with. All right. So, uh, but the really uh, uh, surprising thing to many uh, some years ago was that actually when you take a single crystal of KTO and you um, gate it by using uh, ionic liquid, uh, what you get is a uh, conducting electron gas at the surface. And um, if you choose the right conditions and cool it down to low temperatures, you see superconductivity at about uh, 47 millikelvin TC, the highest value that they reported. Uh, one of the, you know, there, there were several very interesting things about this, this, this work. They had, they saw a dome in TC, uh, they, but they also saw very, very small, very low uh, critical currents and very low critical magnetic fields. All right. And, uh, and uh, you know, for those of you who worked with ionic liquids, uh, this was still sort of early in the day when ionic liquids were being used widely now, of course, to do all kinds of gating. Uh, uh, now it's well known that at these voltages, like six volts that you apply, um, you get electrochemistry at the surface. So you get, you know, ion exchange, you get your oxygen vacancies form, formed and uh, all kinds of interesting things happen. And uh, so, so, but nonetheless, it was very exciting uh, when this happened and, and, and this sort of remained uh, a flag, uh, you know, on KTO that, yeah, it can go superconducting, but not much happened since. Okay, so a little bit more about the electronic structure of KTO. Um, uh, the 111 surface of KTO is a little less than the uh, O1 surface. So it turns out you can make electron gases on KTO uh, by cleaving and, and by exposing to UV light and, and such. And uh, people have done this and, uh, and they found uh, electronic states at the surface. Uh, uh, you know, they found a Fermi surface with photo emission. Um, without going into these details, uh, you can see the six fold symmetry uh, and uh, it's confirmed, you know, it sort of lines up with what people expect from. Uh, from uh, uh, DFT and such, and uh, they see these uh, states, and not only that, they can sort of see uh, the mini bands that form near the surface when you have confinement, you know, you have a two deg, so there's some sort of a confining potential near the surface, and that causes, uh, you know, sort of multiple bands uh, due to, to show up, mini bands, uh, to, you know, to uh, multiple levels to show up, and, and, and indeed they, they, they see that, okay, so they see uh, different uh, 
copies of the band structure uh, in their two dag, uh, depending on the carrier density. All right. So uh, fine. So this is. Uh, uh, I, I should mention though that, that experimentally, at least, there's no uh, direct evidence in the photo emission yet, as far as I know, for uh, the sort of uh, spin splitting or Rajput type thing. Uh, it's theoretically positive to be there, but but they haven't seen that yet very clearly in, 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 in one 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 two days yet. Okay. So um, okay. So our samples. So how do we make our samples? Uh, we we did this in a couple of different ways. Uh, we grew EUO on on KTO one 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 using MBE. And in, in fact, uh, we made no effort to try and make it very crystalline. It turns out EU uh, europium uh, does not want to stick to uh, potassium tantalate at the temperatures that we were, trying, we were growing our samples. So there are various different uh, things we did, massaged to, to make this happen. And, and uh, eventually we grew a layer of EUO on, on uh, KTO. I should really say EUX because we don't know the composition exactly. Um, uh, so, uh, you, you found this polycrystalline film, as you can see in TEM on, on, on KTO, and, uh, and uh, uh, we grew also uh, LAO, that's non uh using just PLD uh, and at room temperature, actually, uh, or even you can grow this at very low temperature if you want, and, uh, and uh, you can form uh, this amorphous layer of lanthanum luminate on uh, potassium tantalate, and, uh, and this too uh, formed the two-dimensional electron gas. And these conditions uh, are all detailed in our paper. Okay, and you can go look in the supplemental materials and it's all in there. All right, so uh, um, consistently what we found is that uh, the O1-2 DEGs always have higher mobility for comparable densities uh, to the 1-1-1-2 DEG, right? Uh, so that was the first finding, and, and we were actually very curious to see how these different things behave. Uh, and uh, and uh, we found when we looked closely uh, with TEM at, at our samples, and this is uh, using both annular bright field, which, which is sensitive to oxygen and light atoms, and uh, high angle annular uh, dark field image, uh, uh, which is sensitive to heavy atoms, right? So there in both these uh, techniques, what we found is that the interface is not, you know, what you would draw in a PowerPoint picture. What's really going on is that uh, near the interface of between EUO and KTO, uh, in, in the KTO, there is actually uh, 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 some oxygen vacancies. And you can see this uh, in the annular bright field image. If you look on your left, uh, okay, so the top left is the uh, direction of the arrow going into KTO. So on the right panel, B, uh, if you start from the left, that's where the interface is. And as you go into the KTO, what you find is that the intensity of, of this blue, in the places where those blue arrows are, that stands for where the oxygen ought to be, uh, there is, uh, there's a suppression of that intensity near the interface. Um, in the bottom panel on the left, uh, is uh, is the uh, high Z, uh, you know, um, uh, te uh, sensitive technique. And there, what we are looking at in this particular profile uh, is uh, looking at a, an alternation of tantalum and potassium, tantalum, potassium. The big, big, big peaks are tantalum and, and sort of in the valleys, there's potassium. Okay. Uh, now, when you get close to the interface, what you find is that, uh, you know, that, that, that thing where there was nothing there, essentially where the potassium is much lighter than tantalum. Uh, you see these extra peaks, okay? And it turns out those are actually the European atoms that have gotten into the sample. Now, exactly the same thing happens for uh, EUO uh, for, for in the, on the OO1 direction. Uh, you get this, uh, and also uh, very similar things happen when you use LAO in the sense that lanthanum does get in into this uh, top few layers of the EUO. All right, so both of these things, as you all know, uh, oxygen vacancies and uh, cations with higher you know, valence oxidation states should give rise to electron doping, and that is indeed uh, what we think is going on. Okay, uh, we haven't, you know, this is just uh, some some circumstantial evidence, but this is what we think is going on. I should mention again that EUO is not crystalline, uh, LAO is not crystalline; it's amorphous, so we don't have uh, any mechanism uh, for any kind of uh, you know catastrophe, anything like that in our, in our in our samples, as far as we know. Now, one thing that that all of us, uh, you know, that I particularly knew was that uh, um, you know, okay, so KTO one 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 highly, you know, very high energy surface, uh, weird things can happen. For example, tantalum could leach out, okay, with the surface. So tantalum could just, the potassium could be blown, blown away. You could be left with a thin layer of tantalum, for example, you know, maybe it, maybe it uh, reduces very easily. And then, uh, then you get, uh, you get a layer of tantalum and that could superconduct. And in fact, uh, ultra thin films of tantalum have been known to superconduct with a TC comparable to what we see in our samples, right? And in fact, you can see a 2D, uh, you know, what's called this, this transition on the left, the superconductor insulator transition in two dimensions. You can see that, uh, and that's very nice. 
uh, uh, but you know, we wanted to make sure that in our samples that was not the case, right? So we went in with uh, with um, uh, with X-rays uh, uh, at the tantalum uh, L3 edge. Uh, we did zanes at uh, what we call you know shallow angle and on a, on a high angle. The high angle is five degrees. The shallow angle is really glancing at about 0.16 degrees. This is all done the APS, and uh, we looked for tantalum. And at least as far as we could see, there was no you know elemental tantalum at the surface or the interface. So uh, what we saw was something very close to, to tantalum five plus and oxidation state. And in fact, uh, if you went in at the glancing angle, you see that there's a little bit of reduction of the tantalum. The edge moves a little bit. And, and uh, okay, so perhaps that's what we're seeing. We're seeing some, you know, um, uh, some uh, doping at the surface of our sample. All right, so, um, okay, so it's not that. Uh, and so then we, uh, you know, we've, uh, you know, I should say this, we, we saw this first, we saw superconductivity, then we did all these checks. And the superconductivity is very interesting. It, it, it's, it's out about, uh, you know, it's very robust. Uh, it's, uh, uh, and you notice there are fluctuations out to even, uh, so there's an enhancement of conductivity out to even beyond four Kelvin. In fact, we see it up to like 10 Kelvin in our samples and some samples. And so, uh, in fact, that's how we guessed it was superconducting. We, do, we don't always measure our samples in a dilution fridge. We guessed there was superconductivity initially and then looked harder and, and we found it. Uh, so uh, the, the densities, in fact, uh, from Hall measurements, if you naively interpret the Hall measurements to mean uh, to give you a carrier density, uh, would, would tell you the densities are between uh, 6 times 10 to the 13 and uh, 1 times 10 to the 14 per centimeter squared. And they sort of monotonically increase as you increase density on this set of samples. Okay, uh, it turned out that, I, and, and I was very uh, early in the game, uh, I was pretty convinced that, that we, we had oxygen vacancies or some sort of interdiffusion at the interface, and we tried LAO for that reason, and uh, amorphous LAO gave us, also gave us superconductivity, slightly lower temperature, but, but it was there on the 111 surface. Um, uh, and what was really, uh, you know, uh, intriguing uh, right, uh, right away was for the same you know, set of densities, if you go look at the 001 surface of KTO, which is a much better studied surface, very widely studied surface, you have um, essentially no superconductivity as far as we could see. Okay. So, uh, so, so that's a puzzle. Right? That's the first big puzzle. Why is, why is that the case? Maybe there's something special about the 111 surface. Now, if you uh, turn on, um, I'm, I'm missing a slide here. Hmm. So anyway, so uh, if you turn on um, magnetic fields, you can drive the superconductivity away, like you would imagine, and uh, and uh, the critical fields are quite high. Uh, they are, they are for this sample. It was uh, you know over a tesla, well over a tesla for out of plane fields. And uh, our first evidence that there this two dimensional superconductivity is from the fact that the in plane uh, uh, critical field is much much higher than the out of plane one. Okay, it's like nine times higher. Okay, and in fact, at the lowest temperatures with our 14 Tesla system that we had, uh, we could not actually drive the system normal. <clears throat> okay, so uh, so uh, most of you perhaps know that that uh, that, that superconductivity is killed uh, by the formation of vortices, and when the vortices coalesce, right, the cores of these vortices when they coalesce, the whole system gets normal, and you you you, you essentially recover your normal state. And um, if you apply the magnetic field in the plane. Then, uh, then you don't you don't have the two dimensions to do it in anymore, and you have to sort of squeeze your vortex, if your flux quantum, if you will, not the flux quantum, the vortex core actually, within uh, the thickness of your film, and that of course requires a higher magnetic field, and so uh, you can you can you know see, find these expressions for what they should do as to with temperature, the critical fields should do with temperature, um, <clears throat> as a result of this, uh, uh, and uh, and in fact that's what we find. Okay, that the critical field for out of plane uh, looks like a straight line as a function of temperature. Uh, cooling down, it just rises linearly. And the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the in-plane one uh, for field parallel to the film, uh, it has this square root dependence. Okay? And this is all very, uh, very standard for two-dimensional superconductors. So it was, it was just confirmed it. <clears throat> and we were suspecting, of course, all along that this was two-dimensional. Uh, more evidence for the same is found in uh, in measure, measurements of critical current. Uh, I should mention there are some constraints here. The critical currents are actually very high. And we are not able to determine how high they are because our fridge wiring doesn't let us go, you know, will not hold up if we drive that current through, it won't, the fridge won't cool anymore. And there are problems. So, so we are restricted in temperatures. You know, in our data, you will often find that we never measure critical currents above like a, you know, below like a Kelvin uh, if, if, our, if our 
if our samples are <clears throat> have a higher TC. So so far uh, we we explored uh, the region near TC fairly well, and and, and we uh, we think we can explain many of this. You know uh, what we see by again uh, sort of the standard costless thallus type thing, where the 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 IV characteristic uh, goes through uh, becomes steeper and steeper as you cool down, and then at you know you pick some. You know, we, we don't we don't have data for our v equals i cubed, but there is some region in between in this particular sample uh, where that that uh, relation is obeyed, and uh, and and actually we have measured in other samples, and uh, that temperature is very very close to where we can't measure the resistance uh, hardly at all anymore. So it is consistent with the KT transition. All right. So uh, oh, I should this is the slide I was looking for earlier <clears throat> is that. Uh, following our work, uh, very soon actually, because KT was well studied, other groups had samples that that had two DEGs and other surfaces. For example, this group in China reported that they found superconductivity also in the 110 surface. Okay, the 110 interface. So the one that is not superconducting is uh, 001. Uh, both 110 and 111 are superconducting, and the 111 has a TC now as high as two and a half Kelvin in our lab. Okay. All right. So then it brings me to the second part of my talk. Which is about nematicity, right? Uh, so, so the thing that really got us excited uh, because you know we we uh, we we like KTO, we like superconductivity, but finding a two Kelvin superconductor is nice, very nice actually. I would love to find one <laughs> more often, uh, uh, but but uh, but uh, you know uh, at the end of the day, uh, it's a two Kelvin superconductor, two dimensional. All of that is very nice, but what was really sort of mind blowing to us was what I'm going to show you next, which is that. In samples with slightly higher mobility and lower density, what we find is that when we cool down the sample from the normal state, right, before we become superconducting, the resistance measured in a simple van der Waals type geometry, where we are measuring along the edges of the sample, say, you know, in the square that you see in the middle, you know, you do voltage and current on the sides going one way and then the other way, right? And we've done it, you know, every other way you can think of. Uh, what you find is that the resistance. <clears throat> Uh, you know, going along one particular direction on this on, on the on the on the edge of the sample, this is like current along one one bar O. Uh, what you'll find, I'm going to call the, the hard direction. Sometimes the resistance actually rises, then then it, it sort of settles down, and then at some lower temperature, it crashes down to zero. In the other direction, the easy direction, what you find the resistance comes down, then again it flattens out a little bit and then crashes. Okay, and if you start with a low temperature. And you start applying a magnetic field, like 0.1 Kelvin, and you apply a magnetic field. What you find is that the resistance will rise uh, in, on, in both directions, right? For currents along both directions, but they'll behave very differently as they approach the normal state. In one case, uh, for the hard direction, it'll go up to high value, higher than normal state, and come down again. And the other direction, it sort of rises up then flattens out. It has a the almost linear slope, actually, which should, which should tell you kind of what it might be. And and then it flattens out again, right? So uh, I'm somewhat familiar with with this stuff. I, I, I used to work in a lab that did 2D superconductivity, uh, a lot of it, and so I knew uh, about this kind of physics a little bit. But what was really amazing was that depending on the direction of current, you would see these different physics. So the red curve is what you would find in a granular superconductor, when essentially what happens is that you um, you kill uh, the coupling between the grains. And then the electrons, the normal electrons in the grains cannot hop anymore because there is a, um, uh, they cannot, okay, so there's a gap in the grains. Oh, here's the picture. There's a gap in the grains and the, the quasi particle current can't overcome that gap. And that's why the resistance rises. Okay, so this is the famous work done in uh, Alan Goldman's lab back in the late 80s and early 90s and even before that, uh, and other groups as well. So this is a very well known piece of physics where you have grains that are superconducting. The electrons uh, experience the superconducting gap as a gap, actually, uh, for, for quasi-particle excitations, and then the transport becomes uh, uh, activated, like you're saying, becomes insulating. Okay, so the neat thing here, though, is that it seems in this data that in one direction, it is not granular. In the other direction, it is granular, okay? So, so then, uh, you know, your sort of logical conclusion would be that it could be that there are the puddles or grains of superconductivity. They couple very strongly in one direction, but not in the other as much. We have lots of evidence for this now, but I'm going to stick to just the, what's in the paper for now. Okay, that this nematicity is arising out of some superconducting state. 
Okay. So um, one other thing that that is very remarkable is that that when you go close to the transition, <clears throat> for a fairly small magnetic field, uh, the system uh, has a very sharp response. So here I'm just showing you that rise along one direction, and if you that region apply magnetic field, you find that the superconduct the resistance just comes down right away, and then it settles down to the normal state value at higher fields. And um, if you go in the stuff that's turning down, a small magnetic field makes it rise and then settle down at a high magnetic field. Okay. So basically, we're talking about you know hundred Gauss type levels, okay? And it's, a, it's enough to suppress uh, these these ri up rising and falling features in superconductivity in your in your in our samples. Okay. So uh, also uh, even in samples where when you measure R versus T, you don't see much at all uh, of of this the strike, if you will, this this phase of uh, you know, an isotropic phase, if you turn on magnetic fields, it can amplify that effect. So you saw the top left-hand uh, data already. As you go uh, to higher and higher, uh, to lower and lower mobilities, uh, in this case, what you find is that the um, this anisotropy is not as strong, but it's there, uh, and uh, you, can, you can reveal it by applying a magnetic field at low temperatures, so like at 0.1 Kelvin. So, uh, so anyway, so, so we began thinking about this. Why, you know, why is it that it's sensitive? For example, and it happens at low carrier, carrier uh, densities. It happens at higher mobilities, uh, and uh, and it turns out that actually uh, there's some literature going back now a, a long time saying that this nematicity, when it does occur in two dimensions, particularly, is very sensitive to disorder. In fact, as in many things in two dimensions, uh, where a very small amount of disorder can actually break these pneumatic things up into domains. So as you make the sample dirtier, if you will, as you can measure in transport, uh, this, this thing is going to uh, stop being as pneumatic as it would have been had it been cleaner. Okay, so this story is not new uh, in the context of stripes. Uh, this was actually found also in strontium ruthenate. I'm not gonna go, go into the details of this experiment, but in essence, when they made their sample very, very clean, where they went, you know, there were like three science papers over several years, and when they got their samples really clean, uh, to about a thousand angstroms mean free path. That's when they began to really see this pneumatic phase. Okay, and also very famously in the nine half filling factor uh, uh, two dimensional electron gas in, in these low Landau levels, right? Uh, you know, Eisenstein and his uh, uh, co-workers found that there was this pneumatic phase that developed in their sample. A lot of resistance and isotropy, depending on which way you measured uh, your currents in your sample, uh, which way you uh, flowed the currents in your sample. Okay. And of course, there's a two-dimensional electron gas, so uh, you know we're very keen to gate this thing, uh, and uh, <clears throat> and uh, and so we did, and we haven't published this yet. But what you can see is that in the, that part, this is a different sample, by the way. If you look at the density, it's quite low. It's like 1.5 times 10 to the 13 per centimeter cube square. Uh, and there, uh, if you if you gate it, what you find is that 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 you know that uh, easy direction, if you will, uh, the place where the superconductivity happens. Uh, it actually gets pushed up in temp uh, you know pushed down in temperature then eventually swept out and also this you notice that this sort of uh, plateau that you see in intermediate uh, range that goes away as well okay and we think uh, this is actually somewhat i mean again it will take me too long to explain but in essence we think that the superconductivity and the nematicity are, are coupled they are they are when you make one weak the other also goes away in this case okay um, again we got we got uh, uh, we got scooped on this one a little bit uh, by uh, our, uh, um, actually, you know, one of our collaborators is on this paper, uh, and uh, he uh, they 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 did this experiment where they gated LAO KTO, and they also found superconductivity in one 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 uh, gated samples. There's a there's a there's a dome, etc. I won't go into the details of this, um, but but they were able to also find superconductivity. But you know, by the way, the resistance doesn't go to zero. If you're like me, and uh, you know, but, okay, so I noticed that right away. The resistance is not zero. Okay, but in this particular sample. And uh, and and so they do get superconductivity, uh, you know, fairly convincing, and 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 it's gated uh, the way they way they show it, <clears throat> and uh, uh, and uh, and uh, you know, so so you can gate superconductivity in the system. That's that's the bottom line, and it's very effective. All right, so I think I'm probably running out of time, uh, and so there's uh, there's uh, there's uh, um, some theory about you know the formation of density wave states. I won't go into this. Uh, you have, my, you have uh, just. You have just one minute, including discussion. Yeah. Okay. So I'm going to stop. Okay. 
so thank you so much. And uh, I'm going to just, uh, hopefully there'll be at least one question I can answer. Okay. Uh, any, uh, thank you, Professor Anand Bhattacharya for very, very nice presentation. This is excellent results. And uh, now this presentation is open for discussion, questions and comments. Can I ask a very short, quick question? Yeah, sure. Yeah, and I'm just uh, curious about the length scale of the nematic phase. There are two length scales to that. Do you have any estimate of that? The width of the uh, no, no, but it's not small. And the uh, periodicity. Yeah, it, it is. Uh, yeah, no, we don't have any estimates right now. No, <clears throat> no, but yeah, and I think it probably. Um, yeah, I won't say anything more. Okay, no guess. Also, I mean, between friends, something that I will not hold. Uh, oh, between against. friends, it's not. It's not. Uh, it's not five nanometers. It's probably longer. Uh, you know, okay. okay. The coherence length we know is like thirteen nanometers, right? So it's okay. got to be longer than that. Okay. So 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 uh, you know, uh, my guess is that it's a mesoscopic structure. It's probably like you know maybe tens of nanometers across. Uh, maybe not that much bigger than the coherence length, but 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 somewhere in there. And the uh, periodicity. I mean, that's the width of the. Uh, I mean, there are two length scales, right? The width as well as the periodicity length. We have so, no idea. We have no, no idea. idea yeah. So, so no. We have, we have. Okay, we have some ideas, but, but that. No, but uh, that has no. to be small, simply because you know to get the superconductivity across, it must be able to coherently go across the other phase. So I guess. Yeah. So, so the way I'm. So let me let me say one thing here. The way way uh, we are thinking about this is that okay. as you raise temperature. What you really have is an SNS system, okay? okay. So there's yeah. proximity induced stuff going on, and as you lower temperature, uh, it, it's more, you know, it just becomes globally superconducting. Okay. So, uh, and, and we have some evidence for all of this, and so, uh, uh, and, and uh, yeah, so, 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 in fact, what we think is in the samples that I showed you from the other group, uh, they did not fully drive it superconducting because intervening regions were not turning superconducting. Okay. Yeah, we have. Uh... Many questions from, from Priya Mahadevan, Professor Priya Mahadevan. Yeah, I have just a small question. You mentioned that uh, you didn't see the spin split. No experiments have seen the spin splitting of the, uh, you know, the conduction band uh, over here. So uh, I was curious, is it because of the disorder? Because... Uh, uh, no, I think I think uh, what okay. So 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 look, uh, the big spin splitting that I was showing you, right? The four hundred milliliter pole spin splitting. That's that's there. I mean, that you can see. That's confirmed, right? What I'm talking about is, you know, like in Arashpa, you have this very famous, you know, uh, spin split bands that happen, right? Um, and you expect to see that. I, I was expecting naively to see that, and uh, and 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 so far, uh, that seems to that evidence seems to be very thin. I mean, there is some evidence for it. But it's, uh, you know, they are, and there are people here who understand all of this much better than I do uh, for emission. Uh, but but there is theoretical calculation that says it should be there, and that's putting a small, let's just say, on the scale of what can be measured in, in, a, in a, like in Bismuth, this has been measured, right? Uh, it's been measured in other systems as well. It's not there quite as clearly in this system. Yeah. Next question from Professor Pata Rai Chaudhary. Yeah. Uh, yes, yeah. please. Uh, what is the, what is the thickness of the lanthanum aluminate layer or the second layer that you put on KTO? Is there a, is the thickness important? Uh, you, are uh, you are not you are not audible. Anand, you are muted. You have you have muted. Professor Anand Bhattacharya, you have muted. Your oh, here we go. Here we go. Now you can hear me. Yeah. Sorry, I'm trying to get out of this screen share thing, and it's having some issues. So, um, so okay. So let me mention that that the, this this thickness of LAO that we put down, right? What we find is the key thing is that if you want your sample to be stable, if you want it to live for long, then uh, then you want to make that bottle thicker, right? Uh, and uh, for our uh, EUO samples, for example, in some of them, we put a germanium capping layer then uh, the oxygen from getting back in. Okay, so so as far as we know, all of this critical thickness stuff may not be happening here in quite the same way. Uh, and uh, you know, yeah, that's where I'll where I'll stop because but, I think it is but, it is okay. Fine. Much, yeah. So does that answer your question? 
do we do, do we have any idea on whether a very thin layer, let's say a couple of nanometer layer, would also give you superconductivity or the nematicity, or we don't know at the moment. At the moment, I don't know. I mean, this is just a, all our layer thicknesses are in the few nanometer range. Okay, okay. Uh, we are not putting down like you know hundred nanometers of stuff. We don't. Okay, but what it is clarified enough. Up. Sorry, I have to interrupt. I have to go to the next okay. question because time is running out. Professor Subankar Chakravarti, please. Subankar Chakravarti. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Professor Bhattacharya. There are lots of questions, but it's not possible. The quick question, sir. Do you see charge carrier difference in uh, one one zero and one one uh, two bar, or it's a mobility difference? One one two bar. Uh, no, no. Look, our hall measurements, right? Um, yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. <laughs> All right. Thank you for asking that question, but it'll take me too long to answer properly. But normally, no. Okay. Uh, one can't interpret simply in that way because 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 you have a tensor that has that is not isotropic, right? That is, uh, and so then what happens when you make hall measurements, right? Uh, there is there is uh, you know there, there's a difference in what you you know there'll always be your current is not going to follow you you know your voltage is not going to follow your current because you're in a tensor depending on which way you're going, right? So so but on the other hand, uh, you can still go ahead of course do all of these things. Uh, you can measure the hall. Uh, and there is no and okay let me mention <laughs> let me clarify a little bit. All of this anisotropy is only really there below about two kelvin. Above two kelvin everything is isotropic, okay? All right, so you can measure Hall completely legitimately at those temperatures, and of course there is no anisotropy, and everything is the same, right? So, right. so it's sort of like topological, right? There's no real okay, it's not there, right? So, but when you cool it down, of course you're not doing Hall anymore because you know you're not doing Hall anymore, right? When when you're in that state uh, below two Kelvin, because you turn on magnetic fields, it'll go away, it'll kill it, like I showed you, right? So, so there is the anisotropy does not live beyond a few hundred Gauss in our case. Uh, if you're very close to the transition, right? right. So, so, uh, it, and, and Hall in that sense is telling you something very different. So, um, so, so then, uh, yeah. So that's the answer. Okay, fine. The very last just, question. Just, just, okay. Okay. So, yeah. I'm sorry, we are running out of time. Already late. Yeah. Professor Kalabaran Mai, the last question. Yeah. Can you hear me? Barely, barely. Oh, 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 microphone, please. Oh, just about your microphone you. closer. Yeah, okay. So, what I wanted to do is that you are talking about. Hello, your voice is very bad. I don't know. I have to be a talk now. Yeah, since morning he's in travel, you know. Okay. Probably uh, you can discuss later because you are not audible. I just wanted to ask one question the anisotropic property along the 1, 1 bar 0, and 1, 1, 2 bar. And you explain in terms of the granular structure. Has it been verified by structural uh, tools? Okay, no, no. So, so indeed, uh, we have looked uh, using, you know, we are you know, we're at argon, so we're X-rays, and so we can do that, right? And we've looked yeah. in, our, in our sample, well, and there's I was in the same thing there. MSD, and, yeah. Yeah. So we've, we've looked, and there is nothing. Look, uh, let me mention one other thing. We're talking about two Kelvin physics, right? So, uh, you know, uh, if, if there's a structural thing there, it's probably very weak, right? That's doing it. And uh, it's very, I mean, it could be, right? And uh, that is there and we're not seeing it. So, uh, you know, the answer is that we haven't found it yet. Okay, that's the answer. There is no hysteresis. That's one thing I can tell you. There is no hysteresis. You cool down, warm up, all of that. It, it, it doesn't matter. Okay, so, so with this, uh, let us thank once again, Professor Anand Bhattacharya for an excellent presentation and very nice work. And with this, uh, we move on to the next one. Uh, uh, Yusuf, uh, there's yeah. a problem because next yeah. speaker is Kahlo. And I suggest that Kahlo explores how mm -hmm. the changing of the system, because if he gives a talk, <laughs> what he has now, it will be impossible. Right. Nobody can hear anything. Yeah, I, can say, I, I, I would like to try something even stranger. Uh, can I, can you Kaloda put off your uh, this thing on mute and call me on the mobile phone? Then let me and at that you'll be putting on speaker and then from me. Let's try. Uh, yeah, anyone? yeah, that would work. But then uh, okay, let us see. Let's try that. Kaloda, put you on uh, mute and call me, or let me call you. Yeah, Professor Kalabaram Maithi would be speaking on anomalies at the Dirac point in graphene.
Shubhankar. Good luck to Kalu and Shubhankar. Shubhankar, that would have a lag. You will have difficulty. Uh, might be, but uh, we have no choice. Hello. Yeah. Can you hear? Hello. Very good. Yeah, no, it's much better. <laughs> please continue. Please start your talk. Yeah, you can hear me. Yes, yes. Please go ahead. Better than before. So, okay, actually, is it my audio is not working at all? No, no, it is okay. Please speak. Please start your talk. Okay, okay, fine. Take it. Okay. Yeah. So I'll share my screen. Yes, please go to full screen. Is it okay? Yeah, fine, very fine. <clears throat> okay, fine. Um, uh, I hope I'll be able to go, but uh, actually my audio was working. I'm having so many meetings. I don't know what happened today. So, anyway, first of all, uh, uh, I'd like to thank uh, the organizer, specifically Subankar and Vivek, for the invitation to this interesting meeting. Uh, it's very nice to see Didi and Anand and many others colleagues here. Uh, uh, I mean, although we are not able to meet, but at least through online we can meet. This is also um, uh, gave me an opportunity to look back some data that we have collected many years back. I think uh, five to six years almost the data was lying. So when Shuvankar said that we need to, um, uh, we are having a meeting on heterostructure, so I was thinking the most relevant topic that I could talk. So I thought that um, this work on graphene that we could really present here. And um, so this work basically started uh, with uh, collaboration with a group in University of Göttingen, uh, Martin Wendelhardt. So um, uh, initially we tried to work on uh, some of the STM work and spectroscopy which I'll be presenting today. And then we wanted to do RPS. So we have quite interesting data, but um, I would just like to request the organizers not to make this uh, talk public. I mean, of course, because these are all unpublished work. So I don't want to get banged before, <laughs> I mean, get it uh, communicated and so on. <clears throat> okay, so this work is primarily carried out by two people. One, a PhD student, Arjuna Pramanik, and a post from Sangeeta Thakur. And the band structure is carried out by our colleague, Bahadur Singh. Uh, so Sangeeta, when he was a postdoc here, he initiated this activity. All the RPS experiments were done at Electra. Uh, when she was uh, essentially, she moved to Electra uh, in a beam line, Padel. And um, the samples, whatever we have studied, are all prepared by Martin's group. Uh, the STM and STS work is done by them. <coughs> the financial support is from DAE and Electra and University of Putin and, and TIFR. So, graphene is, of course, um, I think uh, one of the uh, most studied topic, which almost like a wildfire, it, uh, immediately after it got uh, discovered. So um, uh, I am essentially getting into the topic. So I just in the beginning itself, I would uh, like to say that I am not the most experienced yet. I mean, there is so much of a literature, uh, so many things are happening even now on various aspects. So I am really trying to get into the subject. So it's more like a beginning for me, although the subject is there for long. <clears throat> One slide about the graphene system. As all of you know, that um, uh, graphene is basically a um, uh, two-dimensional, perfectly two-dimensional system, probably one of the most perfect two-dimensional system known. Uh, the carbon atoms are bonded together in hexagonal lattice, which are corner shared. Now, because of the symmetry, you have a two distinct different kind of uh, uh, or equivalent size, which are called maybe A and B, and that actually uh, leads to a lot of interesting physics in these systems. So, um, uh, just a small uh, uh, introduction about the, uh, why the material is so wonderful is that, for example, the kind of covalent bonds 
it holds the carbon atom together 